Hi, I'm Vishnu Srinivas and welcome to Hawk Guide. I started this podcast to give professionals an open platform to share their candid views on topics impacting businesses and economies around the world. Make sure to rate, review, and subscribe. Joining me today is Tuomas Malinen. He is a CEO and associate professor. Thanks so much for taking the time to speak with me today. Well, I'm, I'm delighted to be here. Awesome. So do you want to start off with a short introduction about your role and, and your background? Yeah, well, I, uh, uh, I'm currently acting as the CEO of, of GNS Economics. We do uh, macro analytical, well, macro economic analysis and, and forecasting, actually. We are kind of specialized in being the uh, devil's advocate, if you may. So we, we look for the vulnerabil- vulnerabilities in the global economy and the financial markets. And uh, there are a lot of those now. And I'm also a, a kind of a, how would I say, I, I'm, I, have a, I hold a title of associate professor at the University of Helsinki. This is a Finnish specialty, actually, actually uh, but I'm not currently employed there. I just have the title, <laughs> that's yeah, which, is, which is cool. I don't mind. <laughs> yeah, but that, that's how it works. I, I, I quit at the uni- teaching at the university at the uh, late 2017 and, and been, uh, been a, a, a um, Let's say uh, entrepreneur ever since. Wow, that's that's really incredible. So, I also understand that you're like writing a book as well. So, you know, between all these various duties you're juggling, how, how do you find time to do anything else? Oh uh, well, I I have <laughs> I'm currently um well it, it's a, a it's an organizational thing. Currently, I'm single, so it's easy. So you, you, you just uh, sleep less. That's, that's, uh, that's, all, that's all you can do. <laughs> now, really, it's a, uh, I'm, I'm rather productive, actually. So and, uh, and, and they, we, we have um, we had this firm since 2012. So actually, five year, for a period of five years, five plus years, I, I actually uh, did all of these things. Plus, I teached and did, and did academic research at the university. And they... Um, and uh, it was about a year after I quit at the uni, uh, my friend, who is a uh, professor of health, health economics here in Finland, I met him on the street one day and he asked, and, um, how did you manage through the five years of doing these double roles and all the projects you were involved in? I, 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 think, it, I, I think I I thought it for about 10 seconds and then said, I don't know. I don't <laughs> understand. <laughs> I don't know how I manage. But now, 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 when I have all of the role of the CEO and then we do the forecasting, all that, it, it's manageable, definitely. And and uh, the great part of being an entrepreneur is that you really can take your time off whenever you have the time to take it off. Mm-hmm. Of course, that's that's not a lot, but you can take <laughs> it in the middle of the day, for example. You can just leave. Oh, well, I'm I'm done. Leave. And, and the, uh, what I really like about this job is that I can I can do this everywhere. Just have my laptop, and that's it. Right. That's it's a way, it's a great way to live, actually. Um, yeah, I, I'm liking it. Yeah. <laughs> so you talked about your job in macro forecasting. So can you dive a bit deeper and, and talk about some of the biggest challenges you think that come with forecasting and how your approach um, may differ from others? Yeah, well, um, we just had a talk about uh, about this a, um, a week ago. Uh a little over a week ago, I was in a, in a conference in, in, in Budapest, Hungary, mm-hmm. and they, um, we talked about the well, the war-related costs and all of that. The seminar was the, the conference was all about that, so it was the economic costs of the war. And we had yeah, we had some lengthy discussions on the topic there, and they, um, I think the biggest uncertainty currently is that we don't know. What the uh, what the global leaders have planned to do next? So uh, what I mean here is that then, um, like the Corona lockdowns, that they created an artificial recession, actually, so something resembling of a depression, even. And then they then they pushed in a massive amount of fiscal and monetary monetary stimulus to get the economy going again, and it caused a, a inflation shock in the meantime. And now we now, now we have the energy crisis coming, and we don't. If if this would be a normal market-based economy, 
we would be heading into a massive, let's say, a, a massive recession, a depression, definitely, mm -hmm. and, a, and a collapse of the financial markets and the banking crisis and all that. That's right. that's what's on what's on the pipeline here. Uh, but it really doesn't, you know. Um, we did, we did a, um, a special analysis or a special report on the Great Reset a year ago, and it, it got us uh, quite a bit trouble. We used the, um, used the general or the speeches of the, of the leaders of the World Economic Forum and, and, and the researchers working there to really to sketch out the outline of the agenda. And it got us a bit worried because it seems when you do the economic and political analysis, it actually looks like uh, a plan to take over the world economy. Mm -hmm. it, it, yeah, it, and this is not this is not like no conspiracy theory. This is where you get it. if you, if you do a rigorous look what they are planning for in the in the public sources and do a rigorous political and economic analysis. This this is where you end up to. And based on that. It's really that we we, occur, we have just just published a, um, a a special report also on the stages of the collapse in our Q review series, <laughs> where we where we map out the stages we are expecting the crisis to go, right. and when we were writing it quite quite fast, we noticed that okay, there is this general uh, uh, guideline or storyline, which follows the market based economic thinking. And, but we have to consider also that there is this one other storyline uh, based on the global, uh, the Great Reset agenda. Yes. And so we end up writing kind of two storylines. <laughs> and the other one is, a, a, it tells a story, the market-based one tells a story of a rather massive economic collapse, but an eventual recovery to a, a more resilient and, and a uh, growth-oriented economy. However, the Great Reset agenda or the storyline tells a story of, of complete socialization of, yeah. of the global economy, where central banks uh, use their money printing abilities, but also the, the central bank dig digital currencies to take over the economy and the political leaders and the uh, 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 large like multinational corporations mm -hmm. slowly you know, get their hands over the global economy and, and push it together, keep it together, but make it a, a kind of a zero growth economy where our uh, economic and, and civil liberties have kind of, you know, taken away or vanished. And, you know, the thing is that, um, let's say a year and a half ago, um, like two years ago, we would have not written such a report. No, it's just, no, 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 no. But the things that happened during the corona lockdowns and all the, all the crisis, made us really think that it, there is the possibility that there is some group of, of very, um, um, let's say, powerful individuals who are acting in this uh, kind of supranational entities to drive through some agenda for the, let's say, at least the Western world. And this is something we cannot completely deny anymore. For, formally, yes, but not anymore. Not not after what happened with Corona and all the lockdowns and all. And the and the energy crisis is kind of also uh, man made or politician made in a sense. We can we can get to that in a more detail a bit later. Mm -hmm. But the thing is now, the, your, to your question, the challenge is now that you really have to consider two quite opposite uh, directions for the world, and it it and. Um, Analyzing which one is the more likely likely one is really it's a, it's it's stretching myself <laughs> and all the others who, who ponder it. It really it's it's a really daunting task of of um, forecasting forward. And maybe um, our analysis, our forecasting method, basically um, is the, differs from others. Maybe that we have. From the very beginning, we have done a scenario forecasts. We have all always the uh, the good one, then we have the one we consider more likely, and then we have the horror scenario. And and the thing is that I think many economists are too afraid of thinking the bad, the very very bad, the worst outcome. But we have been thinking that, and I have to say that. Nothing has basically surprised us <laughs> in all the events that has come forward when we started to, you know, do this. 
even the in the even, even the corona we were the um i think we were the the second forecasting agency in the world who warned on the possibility that it will become it could become a global pandemic and we published the warning on the 29th of january 2020 Mm -hmm. So everything that followed with all the lockdowns, all that, they, they didn't surprise us. Only thing that did surprise us was we were, because we knew that the European banking sector was in dire straits. Mm -hmm. We were expecting that there will be a banking crisis and it never came, at least until now. So that was our biggest ever forecasting failure to think that we would see a banking crisis. But these things happen. But it really, it really got us thinking that if it, if we would have been in a market-based economy, let's say, mm -hmm. the Italian banks could not have handled the, all the defaults on the loans and all the bad loans that, you know, the corona lockdowns brought. Sure. So, yeah, so there was something, there was a, this um, urge, let's say, of, of, the, uh, uh, of the Italian and European politicians to, and authorities like the ECP to stop this from happening. And that kind of took us to the path of learning about the greater set. So it's a, we are living in a, a very complex world at the moment because we don't know what's, what's truly happening. And that's, a, um, that's rather per perplexing and, and worrying. Yeah, definitely. I think the idea of like having to separate two kind of frameworks for macro analysis is really uh, a super underrated challenge. And you were talking about it um, just now um, about banking crises. Obviously, you've studied and researched them a lot in your career. Um, mm. so, and we have a major one going on right now because obviously a lot of attention is on credit uh, risk. It, it's starting, let's say. But it, it's, not, it's not upon us yet, but it's starting. Yes, yeah. no, not upon us quite yet, but mm -hmm. definitely not heading in great waters right now with a lot of attention on Credit Suisse yes. and you know, obviously all the credit risk and surrounding them. So first off, just to clear the air about a lot of, you know, media hysteria that's going on, how would you compare this to like the Lehman Brothers crisis, like in terms of major similarities or, or major differences? Yeah, well, in general, I think the situation is, is a, uh, it's a bit similar. Uh, it comes from a different angle and it's also a bit worse. The thing is that they, um, what the central banks created, uh, since two uh, since two thousand eight crisis basically, was the day they uh, the first quantitative easing program was uh, launched in was it September two oh, I don't remember the actual month, mm -hmm. but the Fed started historically this was the first one the first one was the Bank of uh, Bank of Japan in uh, was two thousand two, anyway, uh, but they started it to because there was a massive liquidity shortage in the markets. They started to buy uh, the uh, the mortgage mortgage back uh, securities to just to right, yeah. give yeah liquidity there, and then it's then it ballooned. The, the, they started to buy the treasuries, and and then they decided that we have need to have a good name of, the, of to this, and it came to quantitative easing, which sounds really cool, but doesn't really mean much. Mm -hmm, it, it yeah, it's, it could have been named just the uh, the asset purchase program or the socialization program of the capital markets, mm -hmm. whatever. But uh, what they started was a process where where uh, uh, the the kind of market players were subjected to the idea that rates, uh, yields will only go down and stock markets will, will all, only go up. And this was enforced several times through the market bailouts where they start, the central bank said, okay, no, now we start to tighten. And then everything started to cave in and there was no, 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 we don't tighten anymore. Yeah. So there was these pivots or market bailouts. And this in, induced a massive moral hazard in the system. And it created, you know, the, the pension fund crisis is is in 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 uh, United Kingdom is very descriptive of what's going on. Mm -hmm. If you if you think about where, how do you get the marching call, I got an excellent email on this uh, this, this this morning. But how do you get the marching call? It's just the, it you get a marching call when the when your asset portfolio is is too small or it, it has declined in value too much compared. To your loan portfolio, yeah. So this basically implies, like like I have been known from I have known from Finnish uh, pension funds that the pension funds have used heavy leverage basically on their 
you know, purchases. So they have been forced into this speculative market or, or actions taking leverage. And, it, and pension funds should be the most dull investment vehicles in the, in the world, basically. But now they are in, in a situation where, um, where they really are, have taken the leverage, have taken these, these uh, uh, risks and are in a risk of failing. And if pension funds are at this point, so is every single other financial institution. So in the 2008 crisis, there was, a, uh, there was the CDO, the collateralized debt obligations, and, and they were given the triple R ratings and they spread all through the financial sector, even the pension funds, you know, were, were, uh, were buying them and, and banks using them as collateral, all that. So it was everywhere. And now through the central bankers bubble, which this can be called, it's everywhere also. The leverage stuff, all this, the, the, the risk taking, all that has spread to, you know, in um, let's say areas we usually didn't, haven't seen those. Like I was, a um, few years back, I was asked uh, to come to um, give a kind of a um, talk of, of the risk in the global economy. Mm -hmm. To a one major, uh, to a manager of one major uh, a, a, um, pension fund in Finland, and there I found out that they had gone into junk bonds, and I was like, "Oh!" <laughs> and I, 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 I asked him really, you know, I, I, I asked him, please. Do you understand what you have done? <laughs> Don't do that. Don't do that. Get out of there. And, and I remember some managers when they left there, they were thinking, hmm, I mean, we might have screwed up here. So I hope they, they got out of them. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. But the thing is that they really didn't have an option, you know, because the central bankers pushed the yields of, of, of treasuries and government bonds to such lows, right. even yeah. negative. So yeah, yeah. there's and there are fixed income yeah. investors. They are required in Finland by law to you know to have this small yield. Exactly. But because they even even couldn't get to that, they had to you know you go to junk start, start to use leverage and go to junk bonds, all that crazy stuff. And this is all creation of the central banks. The right. very institutions that's what, that were meant to protect us from financial harm have created preconditions of a uh, system-wide collapse of the financial markets and the financial system, that is. And it's just unbelievable. So the corruption in the financial system has gone beyond any limits, all limits. And we, you know, we, what we know from economic crisis in the past the only way to purge the system from all this is through a crash. A massive crash that removes the leverage, removes the moral hazards, removes, removes the excess uh, speculation, all that. And the question is, have the, central, have the central bankers the guts to pull it through and possibly destroy the very institutions they are managing at the same time? Because if this all falls, and the blame will be put on central bankers, on central banks. They will not be re remain as the same entities from here on, from the, on, from that point on. So, it and it would mean a global like um, cleansing of the, the economic government governance system that has been placed uh, for over hundred years since the inception of the Federal Reserve, and. So the point is that we have this kind of um, toxicity in the financial system, which has, which has spread to all corners, even wider than the 2008 crisis, because it's always on the central banks and all that. Mm. And it's, everything is waiting just to cave in. And so the situation is similar and worse. So it's a... Uh, yeah, it's, it's a very precarious thing or the situation where we are now. And, and it leads, like I said before, in, the, in a very perplexing dilemma of what will the central authorities do? Because, of course, every single authority has this self-sustaining or self-survival mechanism, so they will do everything to survive. So 
we are in a, in a massive crossroads in, in, in history, basically, not in just economic history, but in history in general. And it, it, well, the positive view on this is it's, it's a great time to be alive because this stuff will not happen again for a long, long time. That's a nice way to spin it at the end. Um, <laughs> but it's going back to your point about the uh, about central banks, because obviously, if this does exacerbate, the blame will rightfully be placed at their feet. Mm -hmm. But is there do they get somewhat of a pass because they have to tackle crises like bank the banking crisis and also inflation, or is it possible that for them to address both of these issues without? worsening. There is no way I can do it without worsening, that's for sure. But yeah, the, the really interesting question is, will they get the pass? Mm -hmm. If it's in the, if it's in, if, it, if it's baked into the plan, if we have a, if, if global, let's say, let's call them globalists, if they have a plan to push our economies and societies into this, I don't know, strange zero growth economy, then they need the central banks. You know, they, they need to they need to become become the ghost bank, which was the all which was the only which is the central banks of the of, of Soviet Union and also the only bank in the you know the very the socialized system and it provided all funds and the really creepy thing is that there are even academic papers published in peer-reviewed journals stating that the introduction of central bank digital currencies may or is even likely to lead to the concentration of all banking systems to a single entity which is the central bank mm -hmm. And you don't, you don't, you don't get this. Is, this is a many say that this is a conspiracy theory. <laughs> but let me tell you, economic journals do not publish conspiracy theories. They publish only somewhere. They publish only pieces where <laughs> there's certain logic going to certain direction. You have to be, you have to be, you have to be able to present the path to get there very in very logical steps. Mm -hmm. And they have managed to do that. And they can do that. It, it can be done because the situation is so crazy. And yet, central banks are they, 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 we are letting them to discuss and plan these digital currencies at will. We don't. Some even some financial managers, at least in Finland, don't even know that they are planning to do those. Yeah. And when you tell them, they are just mortally horrified. Oh my God, what's 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 happening? And they cannot do that. Yeah, they are. Yeah, they can. They are planning. And the thing is that. When the crisis hits, truly hits, mm -hmm. and uh, you know banking crisis and all and, and all the banking services, or well, some of them will be cessated, or they, they are not available anymore, it's possible that at that that point in time, central banks will provide the central bank digital currency to all, which means that you have an account at the central bank, and because central banks can um, cannot you know go broke um it, at least in um technical terms in practice they can if, if inflation go, goes very high or too too high but yeah and, and in that case what would the normal citizen do to face the kind of uh, withdrawal limitations and all the uncertainty uh from the commercial bank or transfer his or her funds to the uh, uh to the central bank and the academic literature, myself, our company, <laughs> are are even that it will it will be the one where they transfer their funds to the central bank, and then we have the ghost bank or the ghost bankification. This is actually a term coined by the uh, Financial Times, I think it was a uh, two years ago or something. Ghost bankification, mm -hmm. so the so, so Sovietization or socialization of the financial industry, and this is this brings out. Uh, all the extremely worrying, um, worrying uh, pathways or, or scenarios, like mentioned in the academic uh, paper, which is that you, the whole funding of all projects would, would become totally politicized. 
you know, there, there would be funding would be available only to certain projects, which would be in this case, the green projects, or in the worst case, it would be provided only to uh, the certain political parties. Mm -hmm. So the corruption would be utter, the utter corruption. Mm -hmm. And, and the thing is that this has already started. Many don't know about the European Central Bank has changed the rules of, of a, um, uh, was it Tire One Capital? Anyway, the capital of banks can hold uh, against loans in a way that if you are lending to a, uh, a corporation produce, producing uh, uh, energy through coal or through other means, not green, on green means, mm -hmm it will be the, the loan will be treated differently in the balance sheet. It will be more expensive to the banks. You need to have more collateral against it. Mm -hmm. okay. And some banks, yeah, you know, some banks have already said that no, we can fund, we, we cannot fund them, these projects. Right. And this is this is the politicization of central banks, which is already occurred. And people do not understand it because it's so it's a complex thing, so, so mind blowing. But the thing is, I have come to conclude that it was a massive mistake to create the Federal Reserve in 1940 or 1930, uh, 13. Uh, and it has been a massive mistake to create the European Central Bank, at least in the way it has been created. So I think the whole whole central, uh, the idea of central banking has, has become completely corrupted. And they are, uh, we, we would, I, I would like to see them go, but, <laughs> And, and in the market-oriented scenario or path, uh, uh, narrative or storyline, that would happen. But in the Great Reset uh, storyline, they may be uh, the central, the role of central banks may be grown and enforced. So yet again, we are in a um, it, it's it's a difficult situation. Now, now I have to say that I, I forgot your original question, but. <laughs> But I, I hope this, this provided quite um, uh, insight on the, on the problems we are facing on the um, on the central bank digital currency side. No, definitely. You know, just trying to get understanding of the different problems that central banks are having to tackle, and you know, what they are, are the problem. Are... That is the problem. <laughs> that's yeah. that's the issue. You 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 have a um, uh, what's the well, you you have put the fox in in charge of the hen house or something. Like this. <laughs> this is this is yeah. yeah. This is really creepy stuff. But I, but I think the um, it's a, it's a kind of an inborn human um, uh, characteristic, if you may, yeah. to seek for safety. And you know, the, it may be that people are looking up to central banks of providing safety at some point, and it it will lead to the corruption of you know all that. But yeah, I, I can understand the urgency. But what you need to do always is to try to forecast one or two steps ahead what to where it might lead to so and that's the challenge of, of our i think our of, of our critical thinking economists like myself to bring out to try to well walk into people to the threat <laughs> of central banks yeah definitely and maybe central banks may escape any financial repercussions from this but they certainly won't uh, escape like public scrutiny that's for sure um, uh, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. <laughs> let's circle back. But unless we have we, we become censorized, you know, in the in the well, social that's a, media. That's, that's, yeah, that's, because, a whole, because... that's a whole yeah. another can of worms. Um, so, but let's circle back to what's the uh, to Credit Suisse uh, because you know, do you think this could be seen as a microcosm of a greater European banking um, banking on the brink or? Do you think of this as more like an isolated event? This is absolutely the the the, uh, the former. This is a this is some symptom of, of what's happening in the European banking sector. How fragile it is, and the biggest thing is that according to the information we got, the the uh, the bank the, the balance sheet of the European banking sector was not cleaned after two thousand eight. Mm -hmm. All the bad, you know, the CDOs and all the bad loans and all that they, they are. Uh, by removing the mark to market rule, they, uh, the authorities allowed banks to keep the toxic assets in their you know, balance sheets of the banks. And, they, um, and that created the whole problem. So there is this, this zombie banks, which under normal market conditions would not survive. They, ha they, have, they have lingered on 
in the, in the European economy, mm-hmm. helped through by the you know the uh, um, different support measures by the European Central Bank. So we have these these big banks um, that are very fragile, and now as the uh, the kind of the financial landscape has changed quite radically with the increasing interest rates and yields have stood up and all that. Uh, it, it was just a matter of time when some of these fragile giants will, you know, come to light in the, in the sense that they are having troubles. Mm-hmm. And it just happened to be Credit Sys, but it, it could have been someone else like Deutsche Bank or uh, Credit Agricole or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 it's just because we don't have a, uh, we don't have a, a view on the actual balance sheet of the banks mm-hmm. and, and all the assets. Most uh, for example, because we don't, the market market rule is not enforced according to our information at the moment. So they can decide that the CDU is worth whatever price they bought it in in two thousand seven, let's say. Mm-hmm. And so, the, the, but in reality, it's something else. And it the problem is really that we don't we don't like usually in before banking crisis we don't know where the skeletons are hidden, if you may. Mm-hmm. But they are in the in the European banking sector, and I'm not in a particular expert of, of credit sys, but it it kind of as it emerged from the uh, uh, let's say from the um, well from the mud of the of the European <laughs> banking sector, it was no surprise right. to me at least. Yeah, I, I I think it definitely has bad omens, unfortunately, for the future. Uh, let's just shift gears a bit to maybe like a more general abstract approach to Europe, because, you know, obviously we have the banking problems that are going on, inflation, and even energy prices kind of out of control. How much do you think, you know, this era of deglobalization has contributed to these economic issues in Europe? Uh, what do you mean deglobalization in, in this case? Uh, more like, you know, countries trying to turn inwards, uh, especially post-COVID, you know, looking to their, um, you know, producing an, their own countries. And- there was an excellent quote, I don't, I don't, uh, not a quote, a, a, um, a tweet, I don't remember by whom, and uh, yeah, I forgot it, but yesterday he wrote that they, uh, uh, Germany has outsourced um, his energy, his energy needs, her energy needs, to uh, Russia, security to United, United States, and production to China. What a great plan. Yeah. So that was a sarcastic notion. But this is a problem of, of, of tur- turbo globalization, I would say, not deglobalization, the other way around. If uh-huh. Germany would have kept her own house in order, like not trusting the Russians, which every single f- uh, full grown win- Finn would have said not to do. <laughs> If you know, if German leaders in the 1990s would have come here and asked every any Finn, you know, they landed in the Helsinki one time. The first Finn, I have a question for you: Should I relinquish my energy independence to Russia? What would have said? Why? Why on earth would you do that? Are you a complete idiot? <laughs> but still, what they did—that's what they did. And the, um, Germany has actually been a menace. To, to Europe for over 100 years. It's, it's responsible basically for two year, two uh, wars, and now <laughs> it's dragging us in. You know, in reality, it is especially the second one. And now they are dragging us into the, into the abyss, actually the whole world into the abyss, uh, because they uh, they have had such a crappy leader for the past 30 years. <laughs> so so I think I think Europe, Europe would be a much better place if we would just cut off Germany and, uh, you know, put it, floating in the Atlantic somewhere or whatever. No, but that's that's the thing. That, that, that's a, the world, a little more provocative and, and sarcastic notion, but still the problem is Europe has been for long is it's Germany. So, and they, uh, because of her mistakes, the f- future, of course, other leaders in Europe have made great mistakes, but Germany is the biggest one and she has made the biggest mistake. So that's why we are in this trouble. So, and they, um, the situation in Europe is, is not looking good. Yeah, unfortunately, it's that's not a great outlook. But knowing that a lot of these issues are, you know, here to stay: banking, inflation, energy. Mm-hmm. How how do you kind of see us going from here in terms of a positive outlook for the future? What do you think needs to be done? 
Well, I, I think the first, uh, the biggest lesson. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a son of a, uh, a lecturer of history and, and, and society. So, uh, well, she's retired now, but <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But a, um, we have we have talked a lot about European history during the, during the years, and if there's two lessons to be learned from our, let's say, past 120 years, is that mm -hmm. you should always seek for peace and never ever uh, uh, escalate crisis, escalate wars, because they will just bring you more war. So I think regardless what is happening in Ukraine, it's it's been a uh, really uh, sad yeah. and development in all, uh, in, all, in all angles. We should seek for peace. And Finland, actually, we lost 11% of our land mass when we fight the Russians in, in 1939 and 1940s. Mm -hmm. And we just have to accept that. And it will, it would, everything would start from, uh, from seeking peace in Ukraine. Terms could be tough and all that. And then we would need to build a new relationship with Russia and, and all that. That's, that's, that, that needs to be done. What is happened up to this point? It has happened. We we should turn the page and, and seek for peace. And after that, things could start to fall into place. But nothing good will come, in my forecast and prognosis, if we keep this line uh, uh, kind of if we go if we keep going into this direction. Uh, the, the speeches of of uh, like European leaders are really. Considering the European history, they are, I think they are um, really reckless, asking for more war, the destruction of Russia and all that. That is not going to happen. And Russia is part of Europe, at least part of Russia is. And it's a kind of bridge to, to, um, to China and Asia. So um, it's just like we Finns have lived right next to Russia for quite a long time. They have invaded us in the past. Mm -hmm. But when we got our independence, we really understood how to work with them. You you never really relinquish anything to them unless you have a massive leverage. Yeah. And, and Finland built a, a really strong army to defend it herself, to make it like really ex too expensive to take and then we uh, then we created very prosperous uh, uh, neighboring relations in, in trade and all mm -hmm. and that's how it went and Russia has been an aggressor for 500 years so their actions in Ukraine for whatever reason they took it should have not come as a surprise so we just just Geopolitics never went away, except in maybe thinking of us uh, Western Europeans. In Russia, it always stayed. In the US, it's always stayed. So, and now we are in the in the you know, Europe is once again the playground of, of these geopolitical tensions, and we should start from from peace and then move on to really um, the other thing, peace, and then we would need to cut the strong ties of the EU to membering countries and let every each country to pursue their own policies and then get rid of the euro. And this done, I think Europe would be flourishing in, in five to 10 years time. But these are all, these are not going to happen. <laughs> Unfortunately, the political capital tied in the, in the EU, uh, in the European Union, in the Eurozone, even in the war in Ukraine is too high. So we are in a uh, we are in a path to destruction, unfortunately. Yeah, it's really well said. It's not always roses in the end, um, and I think it's important that you know we have an objective outlook. Uh, thanks so much, Tuomas Malinin, for taking the time to share a really great insight today. I uh, really appreciate it. Thank you. It, it was it was a pleasure. Nice talk. It was nice talking to you. I hope you enjoyed that. For more content, check out the rest of the videos on my channel. And be sure to look out every Thursday for a new episode.